Hello there, my name's John and I'm the pastor of Creative Arts and I wanna welcome you to Rivers United Church. Rivers United Church exists to connect those who are unconnected to God and to others. And we believe that you could not have picked a better Sunday to be here. If you would like to learn more about Rivers United Church, you can go to our website at riversunited.church. On our website, you'll find tons of resources. If you would like to sign up for our digital weekly and receive a weekly email about what's going on, what we're praying about, what message series that we're in, go ahead, click the button that says digital weekly and sign up to receive that weekly email. If you're visiting with us today, we want you to know that our purpose here was not for you to give us money. But if you would like to partner with us, there are several ways that you can go. You can do that. You go to our website and click the give button. You can find all the resources that details how you can partner with us. If you have a question or maybe you have a prayer request, something you want for us to pray with you about, go ahead and send that prayer request to connect at riversunited.church and we'll get back with you as soon as possible. Guys, we believe that you're not here today by accident, so we're glad you're here. Here is this week's message. Well, before Pastor John comes, we want to tell you about a few things that are going on during the month of December. Um, during the first two weeks of December, we're going to have a really exciting sermon series called Christmas at the Movies. And we wanted you to be aware of that and invite you, if you are in the area, that we invite you to come out and celebrate with us. But as always, we will also have church online as usual. Also, on the third Sunday, the 19th, we're going to have our kids' Christmas play, which we're very excited about. And then we're going to have our Christmas Eve service on Friday, December 24th. We will not have in-person church on December 26th, which is the day after Christmas, but we will have church online. If you have any questions or want to know what's going on during the month of December, you can also check out our website, riversunited.church. Now, here's Pastor John. Today, we are continuing a series called Get Happy, in, in which we're taking a look at saying, hey, is there a book in the Bible instructions from God on how to do just that. And there is. It's called the book of Philippians, the happy book of the Bible. And it explains not only how to be happy as though it's something that happens to you, but how to get happy. Is there intentional things you can do to get it and maintain it in your life? And so we've been covering it over the last three weeks. And so in week uh, one, we covered chapter one of the book of Philippians. There's only four chapters in it. And in chapter one, it says how to maintain joy in any and every circumstance. And then last week we came back and said, hey, if you really want to have joy in your life, there's something you have to have. In fact, this will make you or break you. It will bless you or curse you. And it's how to have a winning attitude. We gave you two keys last week. So if you missed any of that, you can go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. Today we're going to pick up with chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. And it says this, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1 it says, furthermore, my brothers and sisters. Now, anytime you see brothers and sisters, it means followers of Jesus. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's okay. You're welcome in on this dialogue, and you'll see what it means to be one, and maybe by the end you'll, you'll want to be a follower of Jesus. For those of us that are, these are instructions directly to us. He says, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. <laughs> so he's saying, hey, I know I'm repeating myself. You know what that sounds like to me? Like a parent. Are, are you a parent? Or have you had parents? <laughs> um, parents tend to repeat themselves. You know why? To safeguard us. You know, what, what's one of the things we safeguard against? I, I know for my kid and my parents did the same thing for me. Brush your teeth, right? Because <laughs> we want a smaller dentist bill. No, we want you to keep your teeth. So we have to remind them because sometimes they forget, and so we're safeguarding their teeth. The other one we say is this, is when a kid gets ready to drive. You got kids driving age? <laughs> I remember back to when my son started to drive, and, and you, I just remember you lecture them, right? I remember when my parents did it to me, and you're like, why would you do that? And you're like, because I like my car. I don't want you to wreck it. And I like you, right? Or at least I love you, <laughs> and I don't want you to get in a wreck and get hurt. And so I know a little, I'm down the path a little bit further than you, and I want to safeguard you. That's exactly what Paul's doing. You know, another one is this. We tell people, lock your doors to keep yourself safe. Now, some places don't do that. You know, I moved out to Windsor when I was in fifth grade. My, my parents moved out here. And before that, we lived in Portsmouth. And can I tell you something? 
you lock your doors in Portsmouth. <laughs> in fact, you have a, a big bolt on it. You have a big thing you stuff in the door to make sure nobody can get in. you got bars on your windows. <laughs> but then you move out to the country, and the people say, you know, we lived out here all our lives, and our parents never locked their doors. We never lock our doors. We're like, lock your doors. It safeguards you against scary people, you know, people like us that came from Portsmouth. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> but, but it's true, right, that we have to lock our doors. I'll tell you one person that did it. It always reminds me of this. My, my father-in-law, who I've mentioned in this series that me and my wife went through a very difficult time. And for a season, we had to live with my in-laws, and I'm ever grateful to them, and it worked out really well for us and our family. Um, but uh, my father-in-law is a survivalist, and I, I could tell you where he lives today, but it's an undisclosed location. If I told you, I have to kill you. <laughs> I am just joking about that. But, but, but when we lived with them, they lived in Chesapeake, and he had a trailer that was in his garage in case the, the world came apart and we had to leave. He had every supply we would ever need in that, in that, in that trailer. <laughs> and hopefully he's not watching this today because he might get me for, for telling you guys this. But, but one time, the next morning we woke up and the garage door was left open. Well, all the supplies were right there. And anybody could have came in, saw them, took them, whatever. And, and at first he thought it was other people, and, and, and then all of a sudden he realized, I left my garage door unlocked. I left it wide open for anybody to come in. Hey, here's what I know. You could be completely prepared. You could have all the keys and all the things you need. But here's the thing. Some of us got to shut our garage door, right? We got to remember to do it. We have to safeguard. That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. How do you safeguard your joy? so important. And so we're going to give you four things today, four things to safeguard your joy. The first one is this, to safeguard your joy, you have to have the right perspective, the right perspective. Philippians chapter three and verse two, he continues on to say this, watch out for the dogs. <laughs> I run a lot through Windsor, maybe some of you guys have seen me run and stuff like that. I'm not very fast. But here's the thing I know. you got to watch out. As a runner, you watch out for dogs, okay? i got one dog for the last four years on North Court Street. He's right on the corner. He barks at me every single time I pass him. Now, he's behind the fence, and that's good, okay? Can I tell you something about you guys that don't put your dogs on leashes and they chase us? Watch out for your dogs because they might not come back in one piece. No, I'm just saying. But just, you know, you have to be careful because the dogs can get you. And that's exactly where he's going here. You have to safeguard yourself against the dogs. Watch out for those dogs. He's talking about people. That's kind of a rough way to say it. I'll explain what he means in a minute. Those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. That's, re that's really going to require some explanation, but we'll get to it. Verse 3. For if we who are the circumcision... That's really weird, and we will explain it. We who serve God in his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have a reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. You see, what he's saying is this. He's saying, watch out for those dogs. He said, it's like a dog chasing you like when you're running. He's saying, watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. Now, that doesn't make much sense to us. And then he used the word circumcision. You're like, what place does that have here? Well, here's what you got to understand. When the church started, all kinds of people were able to come to faith in Jesus Christ, that they believed that Jesus died and rose again, and, and they started to join the church. Some of them were very far from God. They had done bad things in their life. And then some of them were very religious. It reminds me a lot of our church. We have people from every possible background. Maybe you're from every possible background. But the very religious people, here's the thing. When they came into the church, they brought all their traditions with them. Now, some of them were good, right? And we all agree that we should follow the rules and the laws that God laid down. You know, Ten Commandments, that's a good thing, right? Thou shalt not murder. I, I don't want you to kill me, okay? Or lie to me or, or have adultery or, you know, anyway, things like that. Those are laws that transfer. But there's some old covenant laws that they go, hey, that's your tradition, and that's fine, but that doesn't carry over. One of them was, was circumcision. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. And I, for a second, I have no idea how you would know if somebody's circumcised or not. They're just questions that I have in my mind. But they brought in these traditions, and they basically said, if you're not like us, you're not as good as us. You know what they were doing? They were putting their confidence in their image. Does that make sense? I think people do that today. You ever been to church, image church, where you walk through the doors 
and you feel judged. I don't mean because people point out something that maybe you're doing wrong in your life that, that you need it and you feel like, hey, that's helping me. I mean, when you feel like they're looking down on you. You ever felt like that? Because they kind of think, hey, if I have a better image than you, then God loves me more. And that's kind of how these people thought. It's like, hey, you got to be like us. If you want God to love you, you got to be exactly like us, smell like us, act like us, be like us. <laughs> Can I say something? A lot of us do it. We put a lot of confidence in our image. You don't believe that. Go on social media right now, right? If you go on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it is that you do, TikTok. <laughs> People care about their image. Watch how they take pictures of themselves. Have you ever seen somebody and you go, man, I, I saw you on Facebook, but then when you see them in person, you're like, they're about 40 pounds heavier. It's because they take their camera and they kind of angle it so that it makes them look thinner. <laughs> That's called image conscious, right? It's not even an accurate image. Or did they still do that? But I know for a long time, and I still see some people doing it. I don't understand it. But duck lips, you know, it's like, I can't do it. Anyway. <laughs> you see them do it, and you're like, why would you do that? Or, or the person that poses at every one of their pictures. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we're all acting normal. We're just taking a, a picture, a family picture together, and then there's that one person that always has to pose, right? They just, right? It's like, every time. I don't know who teaches that, but it's like, you, you get the idea, right? Some of you dudes do it too, so anyway. <laughs> Stop doing that. Look normal, right? It's image conscious. And Paul is saying, don't put your confidence and image. He says, hey man, I know about you guys that came very religious. I used to be one. I was a Pharisee. In fact, he said, you know, God gave us over 300 laws that we had to follow in the Old Testament. Some of them transferred, some of them didn't. And then you guys added another 600 laws, right? He said, by the way, I added another 600 to that. And I followed all of them because I thought that made me better. And he said, it's not about image. You got to get a proper perspective. It's about a relationship with Jesus, not your image. Stop doing that stuff because it will let you down. I have a feeling somebody needed to hear that today. The first thing is this. You have to have the right perspective. The second thing is this. You have to have the right passion. The right passion. I, I wrote down a definition of passion. It's this. And if you're taking notes, and I'd highly recommend that you do, it's this. Passion is an intense, driving, or overmastering feeling or conviction. Can I say it one more time? It's an intense, driving, or overmastering feeling or conviction. It's what drives your life. You know, you can have goals, but the motivation, the, the, the feeling behind it, the passion behind it, that's what we're talking about. And in this case, to safeguard your joy, you know what you got to have? You have to have the right passion, the right perspective, and the right passion. Okay. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to skip down to verse 7. It says this, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. He's saying all the things that used to be important to me have went away, and now my passion, what I live for, the, the driving force behind my life is knowing Jesus. Now, the word knowing here is the same word they go when you're getting married and you know your spouse, okay? It's not saying that we're married to Jesus like, like we are to our spouse, but it's saying there's a comparison, the way you love them, right? When you meet somebody and you fall in love, you know what it is? You know them personally, but not only that, it's a driving force, right? You love them. That's what he's talking about. He's saying everything else is worthless. You ever had that time where it's like you met somebody and you're going, man, I love them so much that the whole world, I, I just love them more than anything. That's what it's talking about. He's saying, I want you to know that feeling, the right passion. It goes on to say this in verse 10. It says, I want to know Christ. Same thought. Yes, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. You see, your level of passion for knowing Jesus will determine your joy. Can I say that one more time? You might want to write this down. Your level of passion for knowing Jesus will determine your joy, knowing him. I want to know him. Two things he wants to know about him. You know what he wants to know? The power. Of course you do, right? Who doesn't want to know the power of God? But then the second thing he says is this. I want to know his sufferings. I want to participate in his sufferings. Well, that doesn't even make sense. 
Can I tell you, the same thing is true for marriage and, 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 and loving someone. That you want to know the power, right? When you meet someone and you fall in love, there's a power that comes with that and all the benefits to that. It's awesome. But, but here's the thing that's not so, wouldn't be good. Can you imagine a person that you're just a fair-weathered spouse or a, a fair-weathered person that's in love? That it's like, hey, I'm here for you as long as I'm getting something from you. But the minute that it gets hard or the minute that somebody threatens you, I'm out. You know what I mean? That would not be real love, would it? I mean, I know for me, when I fell in love with my wife, it's like if anybody tried to hurt her, right, I'd come back, my fist would be bloody, right? <laughs> anybody? And, and by the way, if it meant that I had to get physically hurt, I, I would take that as a badge of honor. Hey, I got hurt for her. I'll be happy to do that or, or even give my life for her. That's a love, man, and you feel it and, it, and it brings passion to your life. Let me ask you a question. Do you love Jesus that way? Because, let me tell you something, the amount of passion you have for Jesus will determine the amount of joy you have in your life. Do you really know him? Do you know him that way? If you don't, you might really want to think about that today. So first, you've got to have perspective, the right perspective. Second thing is this, you have to have the right passion and then the third thing is this, the right path, the right path. At the beginning of this year, we had a message series called The Law of the Path. And the law of the path says this, that direction, not intention, determines destination. Not just what I desire is where I'm going to go. Not just a vision, not just something I think about, but the direction I'm going in, that's where I'm going to end up. What path are you on? Paul speaks to this very thing, Philippians chapter 3 And we're going to pick up with verse 12. He says this, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold for that which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. He goes on to say this, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. If I could get you to underline something, I would say, underline, forgetting what is behind and then straining towards what is ahead. Forgetting and straining. They're the two words I want you to focus on. And then he goes on to say this in verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I want to give you the two things. The first one is this, is that he says, forgetting the past. Forgetting the past. Can I say something about that? That if you're driving, we kind of understand this. That if you constantly just look in the rearview mirror, it, in fact, it, try it, it, don't try this. But if, but if you only drove by looking in the rearview mirror, you'd wreck, wouldn't you? Can I tell you something? The same thing's true for your life. <laughs> when you keep looking backwards, can I tell you something? Your life will go backwards. That's a fact. That, that you want to make traction in your marriage, but you're still living in the past, your marriage will be going backwards. If, if you're doing that with your relationships, your relationships will go backwards. Your finances will go backwards. Your mental health will go backwards because you're living in the past. And he says, you've got to let go of that stuff from the past. That's a fact. You see, Paul had a past. I don't know if you knew that. That he's saying, hey, you know, I told you how that I had the right to brag because I was a Pharisee. But let me tell you something. I did some things in my self-righteousness that was worse than everybody. In fact, I went on to say, hey, I thought I was doing the right thing. And before I came to faith in Jesus, I actually hurt Christians. I actually killed Christians. I did some horrible things. So how did I get beyond it? I had to forget my past. Now, I want to be clear about something. That doesn't mean that he forgot it like it didn't happen. It means that he replaced it with something else. It's so important. You see, what Paul understood was this, and maybe you need to write this statement down. I wrote this down so you wouldn't, so you wouldn't forget. So I wouldn't forget, and I wanted you to write it down. What God did in your past is more important than what you did in your past. What God did in the past is more important than what you did. You see, Paul did all kinds of things, right? And then he met Jesus. And you know what he knew about Jesus? That it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5.8 says this, that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think somebody needed to hear that today. That maybe you're like Paul. 
you got all kinds of things that you did that messed up your life. And you've been defined by what people say about you. And God is saying today, hey, you want to get your joy. You want to keep your joy. You want to maintain joy. You want to safeguard your joy. You know what you got to have? You got to do this. You got to say, hey, what God says is more important. Because what he did in the past is more important than what I did. Now, it doesn't mean we don't make restitution. But it means you make restitution going forward, not backwards. And there's so many people that want to pull you back. Can I tell you something today? You're not who people say you are. You're who God says you are. Can I tell you, some of us, it's not people in our lives that are pulling us back. It's us. We think so lowly of ourselves or we feel so guilty about what we did or we have so much resentment in our lives. And he's saying, if you'll just give me that, because Jesus died for that. When he died on the cross, he forgave you. He gave you the ability to forgive too so you can let go of your regrets. You can let go of your resentments and God can put you at a different place because what he did in the past is more important than what you did in the past. And here's what I do know. You're not who people say you are. You're not even who you say you are. You're who God says you are. I think somebody might have needed to hear that today. And here's what I know. You see, your past is not your potential. When you're in Jesus, when you're with Jesus, your past is not your potential. He has a hope and a future for you. And you know what you do? You strain for it, right? That's what he means, right? You stop focusing on those things and start focusing on him. And then you can strain. You can make restitution. You can do all the things you need to do. But here's the thing. You're going to move forward with a hope and a future. Okay, we got one more, okay? That you have to have the right perspective. You have to have the right passion. You have to have the right path. And the final one is this. You have to have the right place. The right place. The right destination. Do you know where you're going? Can I tell you one of the most important things as a leader is that you know where you're going? If you don't know where you're going... <laughs> You know, even the, the chat shower cat in Alice in Wonderland, he said, you know, if, if you don't know where you're going, well, any path can take you there, right? If you don't know where you're going, it really doesn't matter much how you get there because you have no idea where you're going. You have no idea what the place is. How do you have passion? How do you get on a path if you don't even know where it leads? And today, we want to talk about where it leads because i got a feeling that this might be the part that we're missing. And it's robbing us of our joy. It's robbing us of our confidence. And it's robbing us of the greatest blessing that God wants to give you today. But if you get this, it's going to change your whole life. Okay, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 11. Now, this picks up after. We're kind of going backwards in this passage. And this picks up right after he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That's what it says in verse 11. That's where he wants to go. Where do you want to go? Where is your path leading you? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Are you just on it and you go, when I get there, I'll figure it out. Or maybe you say, I want it to take me to heaven. I want it to take me with God. But I want to just show you what he says, the dichotomy between two paths that we might be on and where they lead. We're going to skip down to verse 18. The first one says this. For as I have often told you before, you know what? That sounds like a parent repeating themselves, right? A safeguard. Brush your teeth. He said, I've often said this because I don't want you to mess up here. And now I tell you again, even with tears, that's, that's a very passionate way to say it, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, their destination, their destination is destruction. Anybody want to lead to destruction? <laughs> Anybody, want, I, I got to tell you, I've talked to a lot of people, and I haven't had one person come to me as a pastor and say, Pastor, you know what, could you help me get on the path that leads to destruction? Yet yeah, I know many of us, if not all of us at times, are on this path. Let me share you with, with what the path is that leads to destruction, is you might want to get off this path. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mindset is on earthly things. Let me ask you again, where are you going? What are you working for? What are you investing your life in? You see, life is for spending. You, you can't save it. So the question is, is how are you spending your life? And what are you spending it for? And is it worthwhile? What are you giving your one and only life to? 
You see, material things leads to destruction. That's what it says. If that's your goal, I just want to get more and more and more things. Can I tell you something? The people I know that have more and more and more, that doesn't make them happy. And some of the wealthiest people I know, they could be miserable. So it means this. That doesn't, just having more stuff doesn't make you happy. Now, I'm not saying people that have a lot have to be miserable. I'm saying that the stuff will not fill you. In fact, addictions are made that way, right? That's another way of saying it, right? I need more. And how much do you need when you're having an addiction, right? Just a little bit more. I got to pleasure myself, and I think I can't, and I try to pleasure myself and pleasure myself, and it never works out, does it? Some of you guys are right there. Can I tell you what else doesn't? Accomplishment. Some of us live our lives saying, I want to leave this legacy of accomplishment. And if I do this thing, then people will finally remember me. A different way of saying that would be this, people pleasing. And you'll go up and down based on people's opinions, and they may misunderstand your life. And can I tell you what he's saying right here? It leads to destruction. So how do I get on the right path? He tells us. Here's how you do the right. The right. You want to get to the right destination? Paul says this, Philippians chapter 3. In verse 20, but our citizenship, he's saying that's what leads to destruction, but our citizenship is a, is a follower of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is what we have. A citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by his power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. <laughs> you know what he's talking about? Our destination is heaven. Now, how much do you know about heaven? I, I got a feeling there's somebody out there that you're going, man, I, I believe in Jesus, but you've never read the end of the book. You never re read the end of the Bible. You're missing one of the greatest parts. And what I would tell you is this. I know some people don't like to read the end first. Read, in this case, read the end first. You want to know where this is going. Find out where this following of Jesus goes. And in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, it describes a place. It says that heaven, when Jesus brings heaven, you know what it is? It's a place no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order has passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Him that sits on the throne makes everything new. It's talking about Jesus. And then it goes on to describe the most spectacular place with streets of gold and all kinds of beautiful things. But I want to pause there because if you're not careful, you'll think heaven is about all the cool stuff. And it, it has a lot of cool stuff. God has a lot of cool stuff. But you are missing the most important part. In fact, if you think it's that, then let me, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been to a spectacular place, but you went with people that were miserable to be around? <laughs> right? A, a number of years ago, when I say a number, it's been a long time. When my son was eight, he's 23 now, we went to Disney World. And we had a great time as a family. In fact, it's one of our favorite memories, and, and we really didn't argue there. But you know what I did see there while I was there? Now, it's not to say on other trips we haven't done that, but that one we didn't. And we had an excellent time. But, but let me tell you something. There were other families there that they had, they had spent more money and stayed in a better location than us, and we watched them, and, and the kid was screaming, and the parents were screaming, and it did not feel like the sweet, it didn't feel like the happiest place on earth. You know what it felt like? It, it didn't feel like heaven on earth. It felt like the other place on earth, right? You know what it tells me? Stuff won't fill you. And if that's what you think heaven is about, it will skew not only for eternity, but it will skew the way you think about living now because you could experience some of this now if you really understood what God wants to give you. I want to show you something that Jesus said in the, in the book of John. John chapter 14, he was telling his disciples that he was going to die on the cross and, and that he was going to rise from the dead. And then afterwards, he would ascend back into heaven. And they were really nervous about him leaving them. Where are you going, Jesus? And he said this in, in John chapter 14 and verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. My father's house. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You see, he's talking about a place, but the important thing about the place is that he is there. <laughs> Remember this, you can be on the happiest place on earth, but it's not just where you're at. It's who you're with. 
You see, you can have a great meal, but it's not what's on the table. It's who's at the table. Now, God has a table set, but it's about being with the master, not, not just being at the master's table. Does that make sense? You might be missing the greatest part about this whole thing. Thomas asked him this. It says in John 14, 5, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, you have to have the right place. But when we say right place, you know what we're really talking about? Who's at the place? Jesus. Heaven has all the things that he talked about. But the most important part is the relationship with him. By the way, you can have that now. He said, I am. Do you know how many times they said that in the Bible? Back in the Old Testament, when, they, when Moses asked, and he said, in the book of Exodus, when he was having to deliver the children of Israel, they said, tell me who sent you. And he said, I am sent me. And Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Other places he said, I am the living water. I am the bread of life. I am what you truly need. So my question for you today is this, is as we look at safeguarding our joy, what are you giving your one and only life to? Do you have the right perspective? Do you have the right passion? Is the right thing motivating you? Do you have the right path that leads to the right place? But the place is where Jesus is. Do you live your life for him? If not, then here's what I would recommend today. Would you receive him? He's not asking you to love him first. He already loves you. But my question is this. Would you now love him? If you've never received his love in a minute, we're going to pray. I'd ask for you to receive his love. But for those of us that have, let me ask you a question. Are, are, you, are, you, are you just a fair-weathered friend of Jesus? Or would you give your life to him and for him? Because it is the only true way to have fulfillment. It's the only way to truly have joy. And it is the only way to safeguard your joy. Can I pray for you today? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. I thank you so much for this passage from the Apostle Paul who got very vulnerable with us and told us about his past and said, you know what, I've been there too. I, I've sinned. I thought I was so great. I thought, I thought my image would get me there. So God, I pray for us. I pray for the one maybe today that came here and goes, you know what, I want joy. I'd like to safeguard it, but the truth is I don't have it. It goes up and down based on what I have, and, and it goes up and down a lot, and maybe I, I base it on my image or I base it on stuff. And now I realize I need a relationship with God, that God loves me right where I am and too much to leave me there. And I pray in their own words right now they call out to you, realizing that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. And if they'd only call out to you, you'd come in and change their life. God, I pray for those of us that have received you, that sometimes we think of you almost like a vending machine, that, that it's what we get out of you. And then when we don't, we stop doing it. And if we have to suffer, we, we never thought about it. Like, hey, what if we suffered? for the cause? What if we suffered for you just like we would suffer for people we love, just like we would suffer for our spouse? Would we do that for you? How well do we know you? And if we knew you that way, how much more joy would we have? And if we look at the place of heaven, are we really concerned about the stuff? Or is it about a relationship with you? It's so much more powerful than anything we can imagine. God, I know you have amazing stuff. I know you bless us with things but God, help us to understand the greatest thing of them all is our relationships with each other, but ultimately with you. God, help us to understand that. Make us those kind of people. Make us that kind of church, and we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.